Hello, everyone. Every episode of the VSE podcast starts with a general trigger warning. However, I wanted to begin this particular episode with a specific disclaimer. On this podcast, we are joined by one of our amazing Speakers Bureau members, Sharon, who shares in detail her story of sexual violence. As always, it is important to take care of yourself while listening. Some suggestions are listening while you're in a healthy headspace or knowing who you can reach out to in case you become upset. Our 24-7 helpline for crisis calls based out of Central Florida is 407 500 heal or H-E-A-L. By contacting the national hotline at 1-800-656-4673, you can get support and learn about your local resources. There is always someone ready to help. Welcome to the Victim Service Center podcast. Here we sit down with professionals that serve survivors and victims of trauma or those who have experienced violence and have conversations about social issues. This week, we are talking about college sexual assault. My name is Emily Mitchell, and I use she, her pronouns, and I am the education coordinator at the Victim Service Center. Today, we are joined by two amazing women who work to help college survivors. First, we have Jessica Baker. Jessica Baker uses she, her pronouns and is a victim advocate at UCF Victim Services since 2018. Prior to her current role, Jessica was a victim advocate at the state attorney's office in the Ninth Judicial Circuit working in the Domestic Violence Unit Felony Division. She believes survivors and values a survivor's right to choose the path they walk after trauma, abuse, or victimization. Jessica, thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to have this discussion today. We also have joining us again, Sharon Thorpe Gilchrist. Sharon uses she, her pronouns and is currently working as an insurance professional. She is also a survivor of sexual assault, which occurred almost 25 years ago during her freshman year of college. So, Sharon, thank you as well for joining us once again um, on the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be here again to share my story. Thank you so, so much, both of you. Um, I'm really excited to have this really important conversation. And as just a brief introduction, the nation's largest anti-sexual violence organization, which is RAIN, has an entire page on their website dedicated to talking about college sexual assaults. And you might be asking yourself, you know, why is that? Uh, well, most, uh, one of the stats they share is that women in college are three times as likely to be sexually assaulted and that male college age students are 78% more likely than non-students of the same age to be a victim of rape or sexual assault. So, Essentially, all of the stats they share are explaining that college students and college-aged people of all genders are more at risk for sexual violence and are also less likely to report their experiences. So what we are looking to explore today is why is this age group so at risk? How can we help college students reduce their risk and debunk some of the myths surrounding this issue? So with that in mind, people get the Victim Service Center and UCF Victim Services confused a lot, <laughs> uh, especially <laughs> when we are at the same event, even maybe. <laughs> so, Jessica, can you explain for us what UCF Victim Services does and how that may be different from the VSC? Yeah, I'd, I'd be happy to, Emily. And, and I don't blame them. I mean, we both have three words in our title and two of them are the same. So I think it's easy to kind of mix those up. But so UCF Victim Services um, provides services to victims um, in the UCF community. 
Um, and that's going to be ag advocacy, um, education, and support um, to anybody that's experienced crime, violence, or abuse. And when I say UCF community, that can include students, faculty, staff members, um, and also visitors to UCF. So if somebody is there for a concert pre-COVID or um, a convention, if something were to happen where they're victimized while visiting us, um, we're also open to offering services to them. Um, so in a nutshell, that's kind of who we are and the population that we serve. Um, but we, to go a little deeper, we are a 24-7 um, service provider for victims, um, and we are confidential, which can be a really nice service um, for somebody that may want to have a safe place to explore after something like this has happened on what their options are. Um, so we provide crisis intervention where we might get clients from phone, text, email, even Zoom, um, or even responding on the scene of a crime. Um, you know, we are within the police department at UCF. So if our officers respond and they'd like to speak to an advocate, if there's the victim there, um, we'll go and meet them on the scene and provide services. So we provide emotional support, safety planning with somebody after any type of victimization has happened. Um, we're going to educate them so they make informed decisions on what they think is best for them in that moment. So that could be exploring their rights, um, providing information as far as civil, university, or the criminal justice system, um, and prepare them for what those reporting opportunities might look like or what um, the involvement might include if they decide to move forward with those. And we also provide referrals on and off campus. So we actually provide referrals to Victim Service Center to you all all the time. Um, so we're kind of a liaison for them as well if they feel like they need additional support outside of an advocate's role, maybe a counselor, maybe they need advocacy assistance with professors or um, landlords or creditors or employers. We'll also provide support for them in, in that route after victimization, um, as well as assisting and accompanying them with reporting to law enforcement, to Title IX, to conduct at the university, to filing injunctions for protection, we'll provide transportation, um, we'll go to court, court um, appearances with them. Um, so really any type of support we can provide to a client is going to be what we do and we're going to personalize it for what they need. Um, so that's kind of what we do um, to differentiate it from you all. Um, you guys have a wide variety of services that I'm sure if our listeners are on this podcast, they understand what you all do, but you guys have counseling, advocacy, support groups. Um, you have the sexual assault treatment center, um, so we do kind of overlap a little bit in services, but we have a different population as far as we're focused on UCF. You guys are in more the Tri-County area. Um, so that's kind of who we are and what we do. Thank you so much for breaking that down, Jessica. I was actually going to ask if you did work with Title IX, that office, and kind of how is that interaction and how are you a little different from that, from that office at UCF? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we do work with Title IX. We have a great partnership with them. Um, so if we have a client that comes in, we're going to talk to them about that option. So that's the um, gender-based reporting option within the university. So any type of gender-based discrimination, um, you file that report to Title IX. So specifically, the topic of today's podcast is sexual assault on college campuses. Um, most of those are, if not all of them, are going to go through Title IX when reporting to the university. So we'll explain what that process is, that it's voluntary, that the students do not have to participate in that if they don't want to. But a lot of students like that reporting option because it involves the school. Um, it allows the school to say, hey, um, a student of ours did something wrong, and we're going to see if we can hold them accountable. 
They also offer a lot of protections for someone that reports. Their remedial measures person is great. Um, so we will go to those hearings with them, go to those appointments, help them find the report, um, online reporting option, talk them through it. Um, so we really do work with them quite frequently, um, but it is going to be up to the client as well. So we don't want to impose our services on somebody. You are able to have a support person at the meetings with you. That doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be us. If you think a partner, a friend, a roommate, a parent is going to provide you more emotional support in that moment, we're more than happy to follow up and see how the meeting went. Um, so we do work with them. We accompany them. We prepare them for that. Um, any type of support with Title IX, we're going to make sure we go over with our clients. Awesome. That, that makes a lot of sense, the differences there. So I really appreciate you breaking that down. And as a you know, final follow-up to this question, Jessica, what made you want to become a victim advocate? Um, so I was actually an undergrad at UCF, and I didn't really know what I wanted to do. And I was in a domestic violence class, and I heard, I think at that time it was one in four women are um, a victim of, of violence, intimate partner violence. And I remember just having that hit me really close to home and being like, wow, is that real? You know, I don't know if that's that accurate. And I remember counting on my fingers. I got over to 10 people within my family and friend circle who had been victimized. And I was like, holy smokes, you know, those are people I love and I care for. And I just, it was like this fire inside me was like, I'm going to be a part of this solution. I'm going to call to action and try and end this, you know, pandemic that's happening. So I really just felt a need to be involved and to take action I get so much satisfaction and I feel so honored to be able to hear these people's stories, to offer service to them. Um, and I mean, I really did explore different advocacy fields. I did some volunteering with Harbor House, the domestic violence shelter. Um, I did some court advocacy and I really didn't find kind of the type of advocacy until I, until I found the state attorney's office. And I, felt, I volunteered there five days a week. And I remember I was working through lunch just because I was wanting to talk to so many people about what they were going through and how we could help them and how we could support them. Um, and I just knew I was where I needed to be with that. And I'm still happy seven years later. Absolutely. I can definitely relate to that. I was similar when I was doing my undergrad. I found my passion to also end violence as well. So I'm really glad that I'm able to work at the Victim Service Center. So a lot of what you're saying really is resonating with me. I think when we look at the stats, whenever we look at stats in general, it's always important to remember that they are just reported numbers. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. So it's more likely that it's happening much more than we even know. And so, yeah, a lot of times when people realize that you're that safe person because of the advocacy that you do and the work that you do, a lot of people start disclosing to you of, uh, you know, you know what, I, I'm a survivor of sexual violence. And it's, yeah, it's exactly that feeling of, holy smokes, the people in my lives have been affected by this directly. And so I, I definitely understand where you're coming from, Jessica. So I really appreciate you sharing that. I think it's just, uh, I was just going to add, when you talk about statistics, I think it's right. so easy to, to not connect with them. And I think exactly what you said that, you know, when you really reflect it on your life, you're like, you know, these are real numbers, real people. Uh, it's a big issue. So I think it's important for people to try and connect to it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <laughs> so with that in mind, to start off, Sharon, would you be able to tell us a little bit about your story? Yes. Um, I, it was my uh, freshman year of college. Um, I actually, it was within my first semester that this happened. Um, I was invited by a friend, um, and I use that term very loosely, um, 
to join her to just visit some friends or she said they were her friends. I, I think it was a, a guy that she actually liked um, or had interest in. And um, we did go to a male college dormitory, um, which unbeknownst to me was against the rules after hours. It wasn't allowed. Um, I never had did that before, so I thought it was just fine and it was it was cool. So we we were actually picked up um, and went to the college dormitory, the male college dormitory. Um, we were signed in by the resident advisor, um, and then after that, um, you know, they were like, "Hey, do you want to hang out, watch movies?" And, you know, at first, everything seemed fine. Everyone was nice and friendly. Um, there was no alcohol involved. Um, there was no drugs involved. It was purely, I, I really would say for myself, this is something that I've had to wrestle with for a while. Um, I was so naive of this situation. I was really... Um, in my opinion, in the wrong place at the wrong time. And other things came out during uh, the trial that the girl that I was with confirmed. Um, but I guess we will talk about that later. Um, so anyway, we were all in the room at, in, in uh, one of the perpetrator's rooms. Um, and, you know, we were just all talking and it was just, us two girls and I think maybe five or six guys and um I felt extremely comfortable and very at ease um and you know except for like a few glances I guess which did make me feel a little like weird but it was fine because my friend kept on reassuring me like hey you know we're fine we're having a good time are you having a good time so she kind of made me feel at ease and then um I remember just talking to this one person who I felt super comfortable with and um she basically disappeared on me um <laughs> she left the room and I didn't even notice which was kind of um so once she disappeared I I my comfort level went away um I became really nervous and I really just I felt like okay I need to get out of there and that was like my first warning sign that I didn't listen to um it's something you just didn't seem right it seemed off um and I'm assuming the person that I was, that I kind of had some interest in, and I say interest, meaning he was the, the, the person who I was talking to the whole evening. So I had a, a level of comfort with him. Um, he, he noticed that and he was just like, hey, do you want to get out of here? You know, we can just go find your friend and, um, you know, you'll, you'll be fine. Well, you know, I'll take care of you. And, you know, it's like, okay, sure. And in the back of my head, I was just thinking that I would be safer with him than with a room full of men. And I was sadly mistaken. So we ended up going to his room and nothing was seemed out of the ordinary. Um, he did offer me something to drink, but I said no. Um, he wanted to sit next to me. Um, you know, he wanted to, again, still have that level of comfort and, you know, all the while I, I was like, Hey, where did my friend go? Or, you know, he was reassuring, you know, she would come back and, um, I believed him until I didn't believe him. So, um, I basically at that point, um, just tried to relax a little bit because, I, I felt like I was almost fighting against my senses, if that makes sense. I, I knew something was up. I felt like something was up, but I was too afraid to go anywhere other than where I was. And 
I just felt like if I stayed put, she would come find me. And, you know, I could tell her that I wanted to leave because I didn't want to leave without her, even though she had left without me. So at this point, um, you know, we were watching a movie and, you know, there was some small talk and he began telling me how pretty I was and, you know, he hadn't seen me around campus and just various things. And I just got very distracted. And I remember going to the door and just saying, hey, I want to, you know, find my friend. And I opened the door and all the guys that were in the first room were outside, standing outside of the door. And that feeling that you get in the pit of your stomach, like something is wrong, I instantly got that feeling. Um, and I got um, scared a little. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> You can share as much or as, as little as you want, Sharon. And I just want to thank you so much for being vulnerable with us here and sharing your story. Uh, if you'd like to continue, please do. If you don't want to continue, that's totally fine. Just let us know. No, it's okay. I just it it doesn't get easier to to tell the story mm-hmm. uh, just because you remember different things, even. I, I've told the story a hundred times and it, this part always gets me. So I'm sorry. Um, Don't apologize. You're totally fine. Um, once again, thank you for being on this podcast and sharing your story and being vulnerable with us with this. Um, but absolutely take your time. Okay. So, um, I went back into the room because, again, my thinking was I'd be safer with this person. And when I turned back around, the lights were off. And I asked him, I said, well, why did you turn the lights off? And he's just like, oh, so we can watch the movie. And... And then he wanted me to sit next to him and became a little more aggressive with, you know, wanting to touch me or, or wanting to kiss me. And I, I, I said, no, you know, like, I don't want to kiss you. I don't really want you touching me either. I want to leave. And um, he just said, well, sit down and just relax. Like your friend's going to come for you. And, I said, you know, can you at least go find her for me? And he left the room. Didn't seem like he really went out there to find her, but he said he she was okay and she would be here in a couple minutes. And um, he sat across from me because there were like double beds in the bedroom. Um, and then he got up and he sat next to me. And he just said, we're going to have sex. And I said, excuse me? Um, And he told me again that we were going to have sex. And I just remember saying, no, I'm not having sex with anyone. Um, And he just said, well, either you can do it or I can make you do it. And... Um, at that time, I was just so scared. I didn't even know what to think. I didn't want to get hurt. And I didn't want, I didn't want to, like, die. You know, I had, like, all these thoughts going through my head because I equated uh, rape to, like, you know, murder or, you know, something more serious could have happened. And then he told me to take off my shirt. I had a sweatshirt on at the time. He said to take off my uh, sweatshirt. And I said no. And he replied either, you know, he. it was like he gave me a choice. You know, either you do it or I'm going to do it. 
everything from my sweatshirt to my pants to my underwear, everything was either you do it or I'm going to do it. And you're not going to like it if I do it. And I just kept on saying that I didn't want to do this. And I was a virgin. And I didn't want to lose my virginity this way. And um, before I literally could blink, this person was, like, on top of me and, like, in between my legs. And that's honestly where I stopped feeling it. Anything. And I just, I just closed my eyes and pretended that I wasn't there. And when I opened my eyes, there was someone else on top of me. And then I looked over, and there were other people watching. <laughs> watching or waiting for their turn. And I just didn't have a voice, and I couldn't, I couldn't speak. I was, like, frozen. And I just remember just praying in my head, just, God, please, just let this stop. I wanted to stop. And I, I said no. Audibly, I remember, like, at least once when I saw the other person. and. I just wanted to cover myself, but I couldn't. And when that second person was finished, um, he got off of me and he, they, he left. And then this other person was about to, and I just screamed <laughs> like as loud as I could. And he, I think it, literally scared him and the other person that was there too and they left the room and I don't know I, it, like I'm a spiritual person I believe in God I don't know um, faith is very important to me but like in that moment like I felt like God gave me the strength to just get out of there by any means necessary and that original perpetrator walked in the room and said, I'll take you to your friend now. And I literally lost it. Like, I mean, I screamed and I yelled and I just, I, I was, I just needed to get out of there and I opened the door once I had my clothes on and I remember they took me to my friend and the first thing she said to me was did they hurt you and I wanted to literally I can't even say I'm not even going to say what I wanted to do um but I asked her, what does she mean? And it, it took a lot for me to just keep it myself composed because I felt like at that point, like she brought me there for that reason. And she was as guilty as they were. And my instinct was just to get, get back to my dorm room. Um, which I later, uh, not too much later, but I did leave with the people that brought me there, even after all that had happened, because I just didn't know what else to do. I didn't know, you know, if I reported it to the, the RA that was there, was he in on it? Would he do something? Would I get in trouble? So I just left with the people that brought me. And then when I got to my dorm room, I just, I went to sleep in the same clothes that I had on. And this actually happened um, on my sister's birthday. And the, um, that morning I, I called my, my sister to wish her a happy birthday, but I had to speak to my mother. 
and she instantly knew that something was wrong. She could hear it in my voice. And I didn't want to tell her, but my, my friend ended up telling her, not the person who I was with, and another girlfriend, because she didn't know. And that's how I reported it. I reported it to my RA. And um, after that, I went to the hospital. Um, so that was that experience. Oh, boy. Sorry. <laughs> No, don't don't apologize. And thank you once again for being vulnerable with that vulnerable with us and sharing your story. Um, it's really powerful to hear. And um, I just want to extend, you know, you were on our first podcast, which is Start by Believing. So just want to let you know that um, we absolutely believe you. Um, what happened was not your fault. And I also kind of wanted to go out of order with some of these questions that I shared with you because you mentioned that you went to the hospital. And I also wanted to ask you, Sharon, you also got help from a rape crisis center, from what I understand. Um, can you talk a little bit about how they helped you on your healing journey? Um, so... I mean, I, I went to the hospital and reported it. Um, I basically, my healing journey did not um, start until I, I got home back in Buffalo, New York with my, my family. Um, and, you know, it was countless nights, sleepless nights, you know, weeks, almost two or three months. Um, where I literally felt, I, I didn't feel, I'll just, honestly, I didn't feel, I didn't want to, I didn't want to feel, I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want to believe it even happened. Um, but I had some, some physical, um, injuries that, that was a constant reminder that I had been, you know, hurt. And, um, my little sister, who is 11 years younger than me, became like my best friend. She was like my, she was my little superhero. Um, she made sure that I, you know, ate and reminded me, you know, to get dressed. And, you know, just she took on a real like big sister kind of mothering role because she knew what something was wrong. And even though she didn't understand what happened to me, um, she knew I wasn't okay. And I just remember um, one day she came home from school and she just, she was upset. And, you know, she's like, I don't know what's wrong with you. And, you know, mom and dad told me that you were hurt and you told me that you were hurt, but I don't understand. And I want to hurt the people that hurt you. And, you know, she was like, seven at the time you know how do you explain that to a seven-year-old so she just wanted me to be who I was she wanted me to be her big sister again and um I just remember like when I wasn't sleeping um I ended up uh going downstairs and getting the uh phone book I don't know if you guys remember the phone book but it was um you know, the yellow pages, and I looked up rape, and the rape crisis center was there, um, and I, I was like, I need to call them, and I called them the next morning, and um, told them um, my story, and they got me with an advocate um, right away, and what I really appreciate about them was that they said right away, we believe you. It wasn't your fault. Um, even though you submitted, it didn't mean that that's something that you wanted. You were trying to survive. And I didn't understand any of that. Um, so my counseling began um, just one-on-one -on -one at first. And then um, in my home. And then um, I went to 
started group counseling, um, which made such a big difference. It was just listening to other women's stories and their struggles. It gave me, they were very inspiring. And uh, I remember sitting in some of the sessions just thinking, oh my God, you know, I just, I want to be in such a different place, you know, and I want to get better and I want to talk about this and I want to heal. And so, I mean, the counseling program that I was in, um, the one-on-one counseling lasted for six months. And then the group counseling was just extended however long you needed it. So um, in that time frame as well is when um, I was going through prosecution. Um, and then also I decided to sue my school civilly. Um, so I definitely still needed that support because that was extremely rough, the prosecution phase of everything. Thank you so much for sharing all of that, Sharon. I really appreciate uh, you sharing your story as well as how that Rape Crisis Center was able to assist with you. Uh, just like the Victim Service Center here, absolutely, we have those advocates, um, the group uh, group support groups as well, and, and the therapy. So I'm really glad that you were able to connect with your local Rape Crisis Center at, at that time. Um Jessica, kind of changing gears a little bit, I I have seen this term red zone used talking about college sexual assault. So can you explain exactly what that term means? Yeah. And Emily, I'm sorry. I just want to break for one second um, and just also thank Sharon. That was a really powerful story that you told. And I just, I admire your strength. That was very, I feel very honored to have heard it. So I just want to give my thanks to you on that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, um, Emily, the, the red zone is, is something that I actually had to look into myself. Um, I have been an advocate with UCF for three years and the context of the term is very familiar to, to me, but, um, I was wanting to prepare for this podcast and I'll be honest, I had to look into it, but it's essentially um, the spikes that we see in sexual assaults. And um, we talk about it within our office that fall is the busier time for us, unfortunately. Um, and just as Sharon kind of shared her story, um, it mostly is going to be um, freshmen women that we, we get sexual assaults in our office with. So the red zone is Classifying that time frame um, in the middle or end of August, which is when fall semester starts, the beginning of the academic year, um, through about Thanksgiving, where freshman females are the most vulnerable to experience a sexual assault. It's, it's really going to be our busiest time for our office. Got it. Understood. And I also have a uh, follow up question about that, Jessica. Why might it be that sexual assault goes up in that time frame? You know, I saw on Rain's website that more than 50% of college sexual assaults occur either in August, September, October, or November. Um, so, so you went into a little bit about that they're more vulnerable. Do you know, do you have any kind of insight as to why you think that might be? Yeah, and, and I can speak from, you know, our experiences through the work that we've done with clients. Um, obviously, if the listeners don't know about RAIN, um, it's the Rape, uh, Abuse, Incest uh, Networking um, website. They also have a hotline. They're amazing if you guys want to check them out. Um, but when it comes to why we think that red zone occurs, um, you know, if we think about it, it's these kids that have now recently become adults and they're coming to college, it's their first time at being independent, leaving their parents, um, kind of finding out who they are. And it's a very exciting time as it should be. Um, and they're experiencing all new things that they don't have prior life experiences with. So that could include, um, you know, moving to a new state and not knowing anybody or having roommates and wanting to develop social connections, 
Um, in fall, you know, we have athletics, we've got Greek life, rushing, tailgating. We've got, of course, partying that's going on. Um, registered student organizations is another big one where students can get with like-minded students on passions or hobbies that they have. So, you know, they might be experimenting with sex. They might be experimenting with alcohol or drugs. Um, and they might not know how they respond to that. Um, or they also might feel anxiety or pressure to participate in things that they might not align with morally or ethically. They might not um, know their boundaries yet or how they define healthy relationships. Um, and that's where we see perpetrators take advantage. Um, they have these vulnerable situations that they either create or manipulate to where there's um, a situation where they take advantage of somebody and create that violent um, incident. Um, and also, I think it's important to add to with a social connection, um, you know, they might not have close enough friends that they trust or they believe, you know, me and my roommate are pretty close, um, but they might not be looking out for each other's best interest. Um, We've had that happen where um, they've got separated from their friends or they've gotten left by their friends. Um, so I think kind of thinking about all of those individual things combined um, really creates those, those spikes that we see when it comes to incoming freshmen and fall semester. Thank you so much for breaking that down. That makes a lot of sense. And Going back to kind of resources that are on campus, including the victim services uh, that you're at, Jessica, of course, and also Title IX. We, we talked a little bit about Title IX and how they can assist survivors of sexual violence. I wanted to ask you, Sharon, if I recall correctly, you did some work with Title IX. Um, can you go a little bit into that? Yes, of course. Um, so my experience, I'll say, that I had with Title IX is um, when my attorney was hired, um, she was looking for a statute, um, especially against the school. Um, so Title IX came in. Um, and the reason why she used Title IX as a premise was the school that I went to was very heavy in athletics. Um, athletics was their bread and butter, um, which in turn, she had the argument that this made, a, um, it was a hostile environment for women. Um, just going into some of the backstory of what happened after I was raped may help a little to, you know, give you a little example of why she used Title IX. Um, as, a, as a premise, um, basically, I was raped by two football players, um, and my college university did everything to cover it up, um, down to not allowing the state police on the campus to investigate. Um, so when we decided to sue the university um, civilly, she used Title IX. So I just wanted to kind of clarify why that was used. Um, and as she was uh, using this as well for another case that she uh, was represent, another client, I'm sorry, she was represented. So she definitely um, was able to speak with Congress people, um, I was also able to speak with Congress in regards to it. Um, we were invited to a luncheon. That was pretty the, much the extent of Title IX that I have, <laughs> the experience. But I do believe that Title IX, I mean, as far as it goes for my case, it was, I definitely feel that um, the athletic overtone and I don't even know I don't even know if I'm saying this right but because athletics was such a football specifically 
which is such a uh, major priority at this university, it allowed these men who uh, were also accused of being perpetrators in other sexual assault cases, it allowed them to get away with doing these, you know, rape and getting away with it. Um, so, I mean, that that's pretty much, like I said, the extent uh, and the experience that I have with Title IX. Understood. Thanks for sharing that, Sharon. Uh, Jessica, I had a question for you about pop culture because it paints a certain picture when it comes to college sexual assault and, and sexual assault, but in general, but specifically with college sexual assault, it usually is a girl at a frat party and she gets drugged. So this definitely can happen. And I don't want to invalidate those experiences, but based on your experiences, Jessica, can you share what types of assaults are most common on college campuses? Yeah, and I think this is a really good topic to bring up because I, I agree with you that pop culture does kind of paint a stereotype as to what to be fearful of. And, you know, that does occur, like you said, but from the work that we've done at our office, most common, we really see friends um, or social acquaintances as the primary people that perpetrate sexual violence. Um, it's normally going to be somebody that you know, um, could be a longtime friend, could be just a friend that is starting to develop, but there's some sort of trust there, which I think makes the power and control in um, the victimization dynamic kind of play their role, that you have some sort of relationship with this person, you have some sort of trust with them, so you have some sort of safety. So when they start acting um, out of norm or showing their true character, it kind of shocks you a little bit. Um, we also see partners, so current partners, intimate partners, past partners, so exes, or friends of friends. We've had a lot of those as well. Um, so normally somebody in your social group. We do see, however, you know, the stereotypical stuff like we talked about, um, alcohol very heavily involved, partying very heavily involved, um, Greek life, athletics. Um, we see we see drugs um, occasionally, um, not very often, but again, I think it's important to keep in mind that's only who's coming to us. I think when drugs are involved, it's a little more difficult maybe to identify what's occurred, especially if there's memory lapse. Um, and with the alcohol, I think it speaks to campus culture and like binge drinking, drinking games, keg stands, peer pressure to fit in and to drink. So alcohol is definitely number one when, when we look at um, components of the situation. We also see more on the rise um, like dating apps. So kind of like meet and greet, first time you're, you're meeting somebody maybe in person, but you have some sort of a, a social media connection, texting, but maybe the first time you meet them in person is at a dorm room or at your apartment. That's, I think, something that's coming up. We also see same sex, you know, male on male, female on female. We also have a lot in the trans community or non-gender conforming, non-binary clients um, and female perpetrators as well. So I do think it, it stands to say that anybody can be a victim, anybody can be a perpetrator of sexual assault. Um, but when it comes to the most common areas, it's gonna be somebody that you know and have some sort of relationship with. Got it, Jessica. Thanks so much for breaking that down. And, and yeah, it is always important to bring up that it doesn't discriminate based on gender or race and that maybe we have a certain picture of sexual violence. In my, in my trainings, I talk a lot about how we may picture maybe a woman running on her late night jog and someone jumping out of the bushes and attacking her and that, and that someone being a male perpetrator. And so, yeah, it's always important to break down 
those myths surrounding sexual violence and to know that it does happen where it can be female and female, just like you were mentioning, male on male. And of course, there could be female perpetrators as well. That being said, um, I wanted to throw a question at you, Sharon, because four out of five women in college do not actually report their sexual assaults. So, Sharon, you did report your perpetrators, if, if I'm understanding correctly. So can you share why you cho- chose to report and how that experience made you feel? Um, it doesn't surprise me at all, honestly. Um, the reason I reported was because my mother made me. <laughs> um, I had no intention of telling anyone. And when I spoke to my mother and uh, my RA got involved, um, at that point, I had to report it. Um, So it was not, my initial response was not to report it um, because I was afraid um, of just backlash. I was afraid of... um, basically a retaliation um it, there is real fear i was afraid of not being believed um so once i did go to the hospital um i think we touched on this a little bit prior in the prior uh, podcast i had an amazing nurse who literally walked me through step by step everything that I would go through you know and she really explained that this was going to be a tough road especially the prosecution phase um it was going to be a tough road and um you know I would need support but I think once I started to recognize like hey, this is not okay. And not only have you done this to me, you know, this, I, reporting this could mean you not doing this to someone else. And even though that I was fearful in the beginning of the, uh, of that process, um, after the way I was treated by the university and um, just, different rumors that were circulating about me um, on campus, I knew I had to stand up for myself and I had to show these people that they could not get away with this. So reporting um, that statistic is definitely accurate. Um, It is not easy to report. It is probably the scariest thing that I've ever had to do ever because reporting also means that there may be that likelihood that you'll have to see that perpetrator again and you know face with a come face to face and you know go through that experience all over again so um you know am i happy that i reported it hindsight yes but (laughs) immediately absolutely not i was terrified um but I, I am happy that I did do it um, now, looking back. Absolutely. And, and thank you so much for sharing that, Sharon. And I just want to echo one more time that your story is so, so powerful. And you sharing it, like Jessica mentioned, um, we are definitely honored that you're, you're sharing it with us. And also, it makes a lot of sense why there's so many barriers for people when it comes to reporting. The things that you were mentioning about fear of being believed, of being retaliated against, um, those are very real. And I'm sure many, many survivors are feeling the same way with that as well. I can see why reporting could be really, really terrifying as well. And that's why I'm so glad there are victim services there to assist with that. And, um, and I just want to thank you once again for, for being really open with us here about your experience, kind of shifting gears a little bit here. 
There is actually a popular TikTok circulating that shows a woman with a clear wine glass demonstrating how easily date rape drugs can be slipped into someone's drinks. From the looks of it, she is just staging, you know, bar conversations. And at the end, you can see she was slipping popcorn kernels in the drink the whole time. And it is very hard to notice even once you know what she is doing in a clear video in clear water. So imagining that in a loud room with a not clear beverage, you can imagine that it's must be much, much easier to do that. So can you talk a little bit, Jessica, about alcohol and date rape drugs on a college campus? Yeah, and I'm probably going to talk about when I thought about how to respond to this one, I think it's going to be kind of going over the more common ones that we see and then some safety around it. Um, so first off, I think I mentioned this earlier, but from survivors and clients we've talked to um, that believe that drugs were involved or knew that drugs were involved, um, even consensually or non-consensually, um, when a sexual assault occurs during the substance use, it's very difficult um, for them to remember or to even identify that something had happened. Um, we normally, they, we've heard that they've talked with friends and their friends kind of have pieced together patches or holes in what's occurred. Um, and that's normally when the alarm bells start going off that, you know, I only had one drink, but, you know, I don't remember the night or my friend showed me a video um, and it was completely out of character for me. So something had to have happened. Um, we also hear a lot about body pain. So they may wake up and they'll notice vaginal pain or body bruising or some sort of body reaction that is kind of um, a signal of what happened during the substance use or their clothes are missing. Um, so just wanted to touch a little bit on how difficult kind of coming to terms and recognizing that something like that has happened and how invading it is to not only have a sexual assault occur, but not even to, to know what happened. Um, we've heard a lot that not knowing is sometimes worse because they're left to imagine the worst case scenarios. Um, so some of the common ones, the number one is alcohol. And I don't know if people will identify that, but it is a, a mood or mind alternating, alternating, um, substance and alcohol is the number one that we see, you know, they were fed drinks all night. They were pressured to, to keep up with the boys or drinking games. Um, so alcohol or, you know, they made very strong drinks um, is very, very common. Um, there's also ecstasy for the first type of drug. Um, so this one's going to be, you know, giving you a sense of pleasure, confidence, increased energy, but it also has psychedelic effects of feeling peaceful and having acceptance um, and really feeling close to those that you're with and a desire to touch them. So you can kind of imagine if that was slipped to you or you were taking that, um, how that might affect your behavior. Um, and then obviously Rufinol or Rufi, which is typically the date rate drug that people recognize. Um, it's odorless, it's colorless, it's tasteless. Um, it looks just like an aspirin. So it's very um, easy to hide and to slip to somebody. Um, and it makes you physically incapacitated, causes amnesia or memory loss, impairs the user's judgment. And when combined with alcohol, it gives you an enhanced feeling of drunkenness, um, which is a lot of what we report or what we hear reported if they feel like drugs may have been involved. There's also ketamine, which can be very dangerous. All of these can be dangerous, but this one specifically um, it has a very strong bitter taste, um, but no, it's a white powder, 
So that's another thing that can be easily dissolved into a drink because it's either a powder or a liquid. Um, but what makes it so dangerous is that it has its effects within seconds. So you might taste something very strong or bitter, um, but within a few moments, you're already beginning to lose consciousness. Um, it can cause numbing, loss of limbs, um, controlling limbs, hallucinations, and unconsciousness. And then another one, GHB, which produces mild sedation, a slowed heart, um, slow breathing rate. So it gives you a slower response. Um, so kind of talking about all of these, we can of course recognize that they're very dangerous. Um, they're very hard to recognize. Um, and some of them are very quick acting. So when we talk about that TikTok video, it's very accurate that we need to address some safety when it comes to these things. Because if you're out at a party, if you're out with friends, um, even if you're not drinking alcohol, if you have something that you're ingesting, um, somebody can try and take advantage of that and slip one of these drugs in into it. So some things that we kind of talk about around drugs um, and date rape or anything like that, um, be have safety in mind. And I know that's not fair because you shouldn't even have to worry about that. Um, but we do just know how available these these substances are specifically in college aged students where maybe drug experimentation is higher um, and more readily available. So try and keep an eye on your drink. Try and make your own drink. Don't leave it unattended. Um, try and communicate with friends or with dates so that you have somebody looking out for you. Um, and, and one thing to keep in mind too, is we talked about who it's more common that commits these assaults. And again, it goes back to friends and acquaintances. So I would also be mindful when drinking, um, that you are monitoring your own beverages because maybe it's your date that is looking to do this. Maybe it's one of your friends in your circles that is looking to do this. Um, one other thing is that we've had clients that come forward where drugs have been involved in their assault. Um, and it's important to note that different substances stay in your body for different amounts of time, which can be difficult as well, because it might take you a day or two to talk with your friends or to get over the shock and finally want to come talk to somebody. Um, and at that time, if we're ready to report, if that's the path they want to walk, um, the substance may have no longer been able to be traced within your body. Um, so that's another kind of thing just to keep in mind when it comes to drugs and sexual assault. Thank you so much for sharing that, Jessica. Do you find that it's very common on college campuses? I know you mentioned that that alcohol is the most common used date rape drug or, um, or most commonly used, I should say, in sexual assault on campus when it comes to drugs. However, do you, do you find that there's a lot of date rape drugs being used when people do report their sexual assaults? I would, I would not say frequently or commonly. Um, like I said, alcohol, is very abundant, very common. Um, but when it comes to drugs being included, that's, I think, far and few between from what we've seen. Um, and that's kind of another thing to preface is that um, it may be more common than we see within our office because maybe they're not coming and talking to us to have us be alerted to it or notice it. Um, so it is out there, but it is not I think as rampant or abundant as alcohol use is when they look for tools um, that would limit resistance or make a, make a perpetration more likely. Um, because when we think about it, they're, they're using alcohol or these drugs to lower the resistance of the victim, to make a situation 
um, where their sexual assault is going to be more successful. Um, so I would say that they are used. We have seen it. Um, but alcohol is, is definitely number one. Understood. Yeah. And I really appreciate you talking a little bit about prevention as well. I, I bring those up in my trainings too. And I always like to preface just like you did that no matter what happens, even if you follow all of those rules or, or those tips, I should say, or not about watching your drink, no matter what happens, it is absolutely not your fault. The blame should always be put back onto the perpetrator, just like echoing what Jessica was saying. Uh, that being said, uh, and, and this is also not to scare people about, you know, um, date rate drugs and, and those kinds of things, but kind of the more information that we have on this topic to share uh, the, the more that we hope to ultimately end violence. So I really appreciate you sharing all of your expertise on this, Jessica. That being said, Sharon, just like in your story that you mentioned that it was in college when, when the assault happened, what do you think is important for parents and guardians to know before they send their kids to college? And what should students be aware of before coming to campus, in your opinion? Um, in my opinion, oh my gosh, I think that researching um, statistics is so important. Um, I know my parents had that discussion after the fact that, you know, they felt like they should have did more research, making sure that their, you know, what the crime ratio was and just having that information available to them. Um, even the student who, who would be going off to school, just having that type of resource is incredibly important. Um. I think the problem lies with that is that some universities are not very truthful with their reporting, uh, especially when it comes to sexual assault. So I think that's something that we all need to work on and something that we should demand that they are reporting assault um, accurately so we can all make a, an informed decision um, as far as you know where we're going to be sending our children um as far as students oh geez. you know i think about what would i tell 18 year old Charon? um i basically i felt like i i again what jessica had said earlier you know first time away from school um or i'm sorry first time away from home you know learning how to be independent um, you know, growing up, I had a curfew, so I needed to be home by 11. So, you know, being able to have that freedom to go out and do whatever I wanted and not feel like I had anyone to answer to. So that all, you know, comes with growing up. But I would just advise students to be mindful. Um, be mindful of the people that you allow in your circle. Um, also be accountable for yourself. If, if nothing else, you know, always have your own back and make sure you even have a way, like listen to your gut. And that's what I always um, instill upon you. You know, I have like little nieces and nephews and, you know, loved ones. Your intuition will tell you everything that you need to know. So if something does not feel right, leave the situation. And who cares whatever anyone else thinks? Um, I think with my situation, I was so afraid of doing the wrong thing or not being liked or just breaking away on my own. And I didn't safeguard myself. Um, so I think that that is definitely something that I would like people to take away from from this, um, especially younger, you know, students going away. Just listen to your intuition, you know, and be mindful that not everyone has your best interests at heart. So you need to have your own best interests at heart. Um, and that's 
pretty much what I, I would suggest just anyone do. And definitely research the school that you're sending your child to. Make sure those statistics are correct, um, even if they aren't correct. You, you know, I'm sure there's other ways to verify um, any crimes that have been on that campus. So that's also very important. Um, we had found out that, mind you, this was in, you know, late 90s that I was in college. Um, you know, they hadn't reported any incidents on my campus for, I believe, five years. There were no incidents. And apparently that wasn't exactly truthful. So that would have, had we had that information and that been accurate, I would have never went to that school. There's no way my parents would have sent me there. So just do your research. Absolutely. And that actually leads very well to my other question for you, uh, Jessica, about prevention. So prevention conversations should happen for everyone, you know, not just women. So what kind of conversations can we have with adolescents before college about stopping violence when they see it and preventing sexual violence? Well, I love this question. This is like the money question, right? You know, why we're all probably here talking and doing the work is how do we make this stop? Um, and I think adolescents or even earlier is really the earlier, the better we want to bring this stuff up. Um, and I think it's going to start with parent involvement. I think consent is, is a very important issue to teach a child early on because it's not just about sex, right? It's, you know, not making your child hug people in the family that they might not be comfortable, letting them know that they have agency over their own body and that we need to respect other people's bodies um, and get permission before engaging them. Um, so having conversations about consent, that it's an ongoing lesson um, talking about boundary setting with your children, um, not only with, you know, intimate partners, maybe as they're starting to explore that in high school or middle school, but also with friends. Um, and I think that we hear that a little bit more than the consent, you know, if your friends jump off a bridge, are you going to jump off a bridge? Um, I think that's kind of talking about, you know, having your own ideas and decision-making, but it's mostly about how do we get the child comfortable speaking those boundaries to those friends? Um, how do we define healthy relationships? So what, what is a relationship? How do we want to be treated in a relationship? How do we want to treat our partner? Um, and that can be friends, family as well, looking at any relationship the child has and looking at what they're comfortable with, what they're not comfortable with. Um, keeping safety in mind is another thing I think that we should be talking to them about. Um, specifically on campuses, a lot of the times the perpetrators have isolated the victim, separated them from friends, or created a situation again where it's, it's um, more likely that they're their act is going to be successful. So having those friends that will look out for you, you know, you hear a lot of people say, you know, I'd kill for my sister or nobody's going to hurt them before going through me. Um, you know, those are a little extreme, but when it comes to having those friends that you really know have your back and going through life with them, so you have support in that way. Um, and then educating them on resources and what to do if it happens. So I think prevention is very important, but also how are we going to respond if your friend comes up and tells you and discloses that something has happened? How can we support them and let them know that we're a safe person for them, that it wasn't their fault, that we believe them and we want to know what we can do for them in that moment? Um, it may just be me, but I don't remember a lot of that from my childhood. Um, and I think a lot of people that I've talked to don't have those types of conversations before something happens. It's normally when you're at college, 
or something happens to affect you personally that you start to, to look at these things. Um, we also have Green Dot at our office. If you guys aren't familiar, it's a bystander intervention program. And it's not just for campuses. High schools can do it. But it does, it trains you on how to intervene as a bystander when you witness any type of violence and how to do that safely. Um, so that just brings up the conversation of if you see something um, maybe happening to a friend or a family member, how can you intervene safely to counteract that violence um, and hopefully prevent any further violence from occurring? Um, so I think that's something that high schools can also look into is talking with students on if something happens, what's a safe way to respond? Absolutely. Thank you so much for breaking all that down for us. I love talking about bystander intervention. And I also love bringing up the subject of boundaries. I could talk about boundaries forever. And, and yeah, it does start with knowing that you have a right to set your own boundaries and to respect other people's as well. So thank you so much. And with that being said, you know, when you were talking about how can we respond when someone, one of our friends comes up to us and says that something has happened to them. I, as a final question, Sharon, I wanted to ask if you had any parting words that you'd like to share with someone who was assaulted while in college. Of course. Um, you know, I want whoever needs to hear this to know, number one, that you are believed. Um, it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter. None of that matters. Number one, that you're believed. And now, you know, is a difficult road ahead of you, unfortunately. Um, you're going to have to learn to, to survive this ordeal. And healing is an ongoing process. This, my assault happened to me 25 years ago. And I still am healing. I mean, I was emotional earlier, you know, just recounting what happened to me. Um, I think as you learn to, number one, forgive yourself. Um, you will definitely be able to achieve some sort of peace with it and um, just learn how to deal with it. And it's an ongoing process. I would definitely, you know, recommend any and all resources, um, advocates. I I just want to say quickly, Jessica, you are definitely, I have so much respect for advocates. Um, my advocate was amazing. And I honestly don't think that I would have been able to continue on the path of healing without her and without a support system. So having an advocate, having outreach is so important. There are resources and it's, I keep on saying it's an ongoing process, but as you can see, I mean, it's still, my assault still affects me, but I just have the tools to deal with those effects now. Um, so just know that you are believed and we are all here for you. Um, you know, there are amazing resources out here and they are here to help you. Um, that's pretty much it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> Beautifully said, Sharon, as always, and thank you so, so much for once again sharing your story and for that wonderful message for survivors out there. Jessica, as a final question to you, do you have anything else you'd like to share or want people to know about college sexual assault and the resources available at UCF Victim Services? Yeah, I mean, I, I think when Sharon spoke about the, the barriers and the hurdles for a survivor coming forward. I mean, all of that echoes still to this day. We hear those things um, from clients still. Um, so everything she said, you know, you're believed, we're here for you. We want to support you. 
And if you are in the UCF community, or if you're not, you can always call us. Um, we're 24 seven, you can speak to an advocate immediately. Um, and we can just meet you where you're at and see how we can support you moving forward. Um, I do want to just let one more time that we are confidential, which can be, especially if we're going to be the first person somebody has told, or maybe it, it can be a real thing to speak it out loud and to say, this is my reality. This has happened. So know that when you talk to us, it stays with us and we are not going to make any decisions for you. We're going to talk to you about what's there, what's available, and we're going to follow you. You're going to take the lead in what happens next. Um, and I, I would just like to thank Sharon again for sharing her story and showing us her strength today. It's very inspirational and moving. Um, and thank you, Emily, and the Victim Service Center for allowing UCF Victim Services to come and be a part of such an important conversation. Absolutely. And thank you both for being here because it's, it is a, that important conversation. And I really appreciate all that UCF Victim Services does for survivors. And once again, Sharon, thank you for sharing your story. And I think that that's a wonderful place to sign off here. Uh, so thank you again for listening to the Victim Service Center podcast. The VSC is a nonprofit organization that provides free confidential counseling services for victims of any kind of trauma in Central Florida. To learn more about our services, please visit victimservicecenter.org. And to everyone listening, healing is not linear and you're not alone. And thank you once again, Jessica and Sharon for joining me today.